So welcome to the Morris Federation series of talks and workshops during lockdown. And today we have Andrew Kennedy that is going to tell who is going to tell us all about sword dancing or sword dancers from the past. Over to Andrew. Hello there. Thanks very much all for coming along. Um, I suppose the first thing I should say is that this talk was inspired by a previous one of these talks I came to a couple of months ago when Jameson Wooders was talking about the um, um, some old records of Morris dancing. One of the things he said, which struck me, was that um, we know quite a lot about where the dancing took place, but we don't know very much about the dancers. And I was mulling this over, and it struck me that with the sword dancing, it's actually quite different. And we do know quite a bit about some of the sword dancers. We can say a fair bit about um, who they were in general, but in fact, um, we can tell you quite a bit about individual dancers as well. So I'm gonna be going over some stuff and then I'm going to be moving on to three case studies, one from the 17th, one from the 18th, one from the 19th century, all of which involve named sword dancers. Um, so I'll come on to that. A um, little bit about myself. Well, most of you know me anyway. I, I've got all sorts of familiar faces out there, which is lovely. Um, but I've been sword dancing for quite a long time. Um, I, don't, I don't dance anymore. I play now. Um, it's the way it goes, isn't it? And I've um, done it with a number of teams. I see people here from um, places like Carlisle, which takes me back. Um, so... Um, I've also done a bit of writing about it, and uh, here's a bit of a plug uh, in that I write for, and at one point I edited and published Rattle Up the Boys, which is the um, way every person who wants to keep well informed about sword dancing uh, should subscribe. Um, now, Jeff Lawson's on here, I think. So uh, at eight pounds for four issues a year, it's an absolute bargain. So uh, I would uh, recommend that thoroughly. Um, so what I'm going to do now um, is I'm going to share my screen, uh, which is always a, a bit of an experiment for me. Um, and it's going to take a, a moment or two to come up. Um, I suppose the background to this is that years ago, um, I wrote something about some sword dancers in Scotland. Um, about some named sword dancers. And what I've done since then, I, I've found out there are a whole lot more, and I've sort of made a rub my own back um, because there's a lot more work to do. Good. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've been last year, of course, um, not a lot of chance to go out and play. So instead, um, I've been doing a bit of reading, and as well as this question of who the sword dancers were, this question of why they did it has been coming more and more into my mind. And I've been having more and more doubts as to whether there is any such thing as a sword dance. And if I could explain that, I'll, I'll go into that in a minute with pictures. Um, when we look at some of the theorists, and I'm going to have a look at some of the theorists in a minute, um, they tend to be outsiders looking in and then coming to their grand unifying theories of what sword dancing is. And it strikes me you need to ask the dancers themselves uh, why they do it. And the answers, of course, are very varied, as we'll, we'll all be aware. So I'll come back to that. I just thought we'd start off with, with, with some pictures. Um, what we've got here, top left, we have... Uh, Whip the Cat Rapper, women's rapper team, in terms of sword dance teams, relatively recent formation, um, rapper, of course, um, doing a mixture of some collected dances and some of their invention. Fine. Um, below them, we have a group on the Isle of Man um, doing the white boys play, which ends in a brief sword dance. Um, bottom right, we have the Flambra sword dancers, um, traditional team, traditionally a fisherman's team, going back here. Roots going back a long way um, with their fixed date in the calendar, 
for going out. Um, and then up above them, we have the Minden Rose Garland dancers doing what I believe is the rose. And you see they're actually linked by their garlands um, as they dance around in a chain. And here's one, if we were all going to the pub after this talk, if we are doing this in real life, um, the question is, can you come up with a concise definition of sword dancing, which includes Whip the Cat, Flamborough and the White Boys, but excludes Minden Rose? And it's much harder than you would think. Um, not that I'm making a claim that Minden Rose are sword dancers. So the story of the, um, the rose, the dance itself, is a really interesting one. If you go back to the early 50s, I think it was, up in Sunderland, um, it was a school teacher who was teaching girls, it was girls' school, and um, he felt that uh, there was no reason that sword dancing should just be for boys, that girls could do, do this just as much. And uh, of, of course, he didn't actually uh, swords like boys had. Uh, so he wrote a garland dance, which is very much sword figures. And um, the North British sword dancers have attempted it. And it's quite feasible in principle if you have younger, fitter men than the North British sword dancers. Um, so we have this dance. Um, as I say, I'd be very interested to know how you would come up with a definition never mind of sword dancing, but even just of swords, when you look at the, the different things being used by the three sword teams there, um, how do you define what they hold in their hand? I'm always struck when, when we go to the Dance England repertoire, which one of the rules is generally um, the dance must be a rapper dance. And it actually says what a rapper dance is, probably just as well. So what I'm looking at then is um, the scope taking us from the 14th to 19th century in time and in place I'm looking at English, Dutch and German speaking areas um, and I'm well aware that we could be looking right across southern Europe, we could be looking across into the Balkans up to um, Sweden as well uh, but uh, we have to control it somehow don't we. Um, I'll be going through some of the well-known theorists and their theorists, theories, just an overview, Moving on from that to some types of dance, some types of sword dance, and then three specific case studies. Now, what we have here, first of all, is an absolutely terrific picture dating from 1600 of um, the Nuremberg Cutlers Guild doing their dance. And there is so much in this picture to take out of it. And the context for this is that the, in Northern Europe, the high period for dancing, the golden age of sword dancing was round about 1400 to 1600. We have reports going back, particularly in the low countries, going back into the 1300s. And by about 1600, you're finding that because of religious changes, there are increasing attempts to stop the sort of celebrations which involve sword dancing. Um, not necessarily directly aimed at sword dancing, that's another question. But if we look at this, this picture, we see all sorts of things going on. Um, so across the front, we have a chain of dancers, linked chain of dancers, and there's 12 of them, which is really quite common in German sword dancing. Um, Well-dressed, these are high statesmen, but the Cutlers were um, a trades guild, so artisans, uh, skilled artisans, um, and um, a high status guild, but they were very important in the life of the city. And they would do their dance, but it was a grand civic occasion when they came out to perform. And it wouldn't be the masters who would dance by and large with these guild dances. You found it was um, the apprentices and the journeymen, it was the younger men of the guild who would dance. Um, but as I saying, you know, these look fairly mature, don't they? So we have the 12 at the front. We have a little bit more going on at the back here, another little group going on here. Um, what else have we got? We have a fool in sort of classic Czech uniform, waving is that a bladder or some such thing. Um, drummer and it 
looks like a flute. Not quite often they, you still find them using a fife in Germany. So classic um, music going on there. Over here, we have these very well-dressed gentlemen on their horses watching the proceedings. Um, so, you know, it is, it's drawing a respectable audience, shall we say. And then, of course, here, um, this is fantastic, isn't it? Um, the two sets of 12, again, 12 men here, 12 men here, having formed a lock, we, we imagine, certainly a lattice or grid of 12 swords. Um, I distinguish that, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and these two men fighting on the top. And you know, these, these are decent sized swords, aren't they? And I say, there's a whole lot you can pick out of this. In particular, when you look at uh, the old records, quite often they talk not about sword dancing, but um, sword play, Schwertdanzspiel. And by play, they don't mean drama, um, but a play was a pastime. Um, in Scotland as well, in Perth, you find round about the same time as the famous Perth Glover's Dance, the Baker's Guild had their own procession, which was um, the St. Obert play, which has been um, translated or updated as the St. Obert pastime. Um, so when you see sword dance play, it doesn't necessarily mean linked sword dancing because we know that um, displays of fighting skill are also a popular entertainment. Well, this all seems to be lumped in together, doesn't it? Um, we've got it all going on here. So this is 1600. So it's a big, it's a lavish event. It's a civic event and it's tied to the young men of the guild. Um, and it was a matter of great pride to uh, put your sword dance on a, a, a one of these events. So that's one kind of sword dance, if you like. If we can move on, this question, there we are. This is another very well-known picture. Um, Peter Burgle, the Elder. So this is from the Netherlands. Um, this, they think this is a village just outside Antwerp. So 1560, 40 years before that uh, event in Nuremberg. Um, and this is a village festivity for um, St. George's Day. Right? Very appropriate little discussion we just had about St. George's Day. And what you see here, these Bruegel pictures are terrific. He, he did a whole load of them of village events and festivities. And it's a bit like Where's Wally? You can sit for ages looking at all the stuff that's going on. Um, if I can zoom in a bit, there we are. Um, in amongst all the drinking and the, the, the wenching and everything else going on, in the middle here, there's, um, it's, it's, sorry, it's, it's not a very good reproduction of this. Um, but the original picture is in a private collection somewhere over. So there's the group of sword dancers. And you know, this is classic, isn't it? I, lo I love this man here. He's just getting his right hand caught behind his head in the way that sword dancers are want to do if they're not very careful. Um, but you know, it, it's a rowdy event. Um, it's very different from um, the Nuremberg one. They are in kit of a kind. They're all wearing these fetching red hats, aren't they? Um, but they're doing something really quite different. This is, this is a local celebration. This is people going out and having a bit of fun. Um, not necessarily terribly skilled or organized fun, but they're enjoying themselves. Um, and so even within these two pictures, 40 years apart, we can see two very different kinds of sword dance, although both of them um, for an occasion. Now, If we look at um, some of the explanations that have been offered, I'll go through these in a bit more detail. We have these ideas of sword dance being somehow being um, an embodiment of Germanic culture or um, uh, religious significance, um, about the induction of young men into adult fraternities. We've got military exercises going on, um, an association with mining, occupational association then, and Sharp and his Vikings. Um, so, starting there, sorry, I'm just going to try something, here we are. Um, starting there, 
Tacitus, the Germans love to go back to an account written in 98 AD. Uh, Tacitus was a Roman who was talking about the German tribes to the east of the empire. Um, and uh, after some brave but futile attempts to conquer the Germans, the Romans had settled down into a sort of uh, armed neutrality and uh, you know, there's trade going on across the boards and they're getting to know each other a bit. So um, there we are, Tasta says, they have only one kind of show and it's the same at every gathering. Naked youths whose sport this is fling themselves about in a dance between swords and spears, leveled at them. Training has produced skill and skill grace. They do it not for gain or for any payment. However daring they're abandoned, their sole reward is the spectator's pleasure. And you'll find that various Germans, particularly in the 19th, early 20th century, um, tried to show that this uh, was uh, the embodiment of Germany, you know, one expression of, of Germanness, and that this had somehow been carried down through the ages. But already by, you know, by, by the 1920s, you've got others saying it seems very unlikely that this thing they were doing in 1998 AD disappeared for 1200 years and suddenly popped up again. Um, and so there's skepticism even at the time this theory was being put forward. But if you, it, it's a bit like some of the stuff you read in um, the blurbs put out by English sword dance teams, which is not always terribly historically well grounded. Um, the Germans are, are still attached to this idea. And this group, the Deep Marsha sword dancers that I've put the picture of, um, they're from Schleswig Holstein, a little bit northwest of Hamburg. And I saw them about 10 years ago. And that this dance was reconstructed, if you want to call it that, um, in the 1930s. We've got records going back hundreds of years to say that there were sword dancers in this area. We know that sword dancing went on. And in the 1930s, they put together a dance and they drew heavily on two sources in particular, one being Tacitus and the other being um, a very well-documented dance from Transylvania, which I'll, I'll say more about that in a bit. Um, so this idea of um, dancing around between the swords, the, the, the Deep Marsha dance is really quite um, calm, it's quite subdued, it's done just to the beat of a drum, um, to a walking pace. But we see them here pointing their swords at um, the necks of the man, at the neck of the man in the middle. Um, and then they go on and do a number of movements which we see described really quite well from the Transylvania dance. Um, and I'll come back to the Deep Marsha dance as well. Then there are the ones who um, thought it was maybe of some religious significance. Um, it's well known that uh, archeologists, when they dig up something they, they don't recognize, um, they'll either say, this is probably a fertility object, or they'll say it's some sort of cultic object. Um, that just means we don't know. Um, and we have these two names here, particularly that I've, I've picked on. Um, the first one's a man called Schuster, who was writing in 1870, uh, a folklorist, um, and he was writing about the Transylvanian Saxons. Now, these are people in the time of the Habsburg Empire. Um, they were taken from the German, the core German lands, and sent out to the east um, to, uh, to colonize, basically. And they were the seven cities, the seven German cities of Transylvania, seven Saxon cities of Transylvania. And we have a sword dance from there which is really very well notated. Um, we have description from 1870, an another one from 1896. These are two principal ones. Other ones as well linked to those. And then another one from 1981, um, where um, after the Second World War, the Romanians, uh, who then by then controlled Transylvania, threw out most of the people of German origin for understandable reasons. And um, there are about 2,000 left now, including the current president of Romania. 
And in 1981, a school teacher whose name's also Schuster, but I'm not sure if she's related to this one or not. She went round, um, she, she wrote a book of dances of the uh, uh, Transylvanian Saxons. And um, she went around talking to old people to see what they remembered. And her, her notation is very, very thorough. Um, so this is an interesting dance and an influential dance for that reason. So what Schuster was doing when he wrote about it, he wasn't actually writing about sword dancing. He was writing about um, pagan survivals. And he thought that sword dancing might be one manifestation of that. And he linked it to the god Fro, that we know better as Freya, brother of Freya. Um, and he associated it with fertility, sexuality, virility, good weather. Yeah. Um, the evidence for this, no matter. But then if we're talking about the evidence for this, we also have um, Sir James Fraser and the accursed golden bow. Um, who uh, Fraser thought that uh, uh, sword dancing was one manifestation of um, the ancient religion of death and rebirth, uh, the idea, because he'd seen sword dances where there was a beheading, a bit of fun getting the boys back up on his feet. Um, and he thought it was to do with uh, a solar deity as well, uh, and you know, bring the sun back in the new year, and all that kind of thing. So there's common belief among some folklorists that uh, the old religion, whatever that might be, lingered on among the peasants. And um, when you read some of the German accounts of sword dancing or theorists about theorizing about sword dancing, you see this view that um, the peasants were the true repository of um, the old knowledge. And this is where it came from. On the other hand, the evidence seems to suggest that the sword dances arose in the towns and was subsequently taken up in the country. Um, so there. Another theory which was very popular in German circles for a while was this idea of induction of young men into male fraternities, the men of old. Um, and this is associated particularly with a chap called Richard Wolfram, but not only with him. Um, and yeah, there's some sense, some truth to it, in as much as, as I said, with the guilds, it was quite often the apprentices or the journeymen who would do these guild dances. The thing is, by and large, it wasn't the masters, it wasn't the, the grown ups, so to speak. It, it, it was seen as a young man's thing. Um, they're also, they're, Wolfram was not the person who came up with this theory. Um, there are other people writing about it before he did. Um, he popularized it. He, he was an enthusiastic Nazi. And he saw the sword dance, um, again, as this embodiment of Germanness, of Aryans, and um, of German culture. So this was something to be promoted. Um, and so there was a great deal of interest in sword dancing um, as a suitable activity for young men. Um, and in fact, it was thought that maybe uh, a leader of a sword dance team should have an SS rank. Um, and yeah, it, it has caused enormous problems for the Germans since then, for German sword dancers here, but other Germans as well, obviously. Um, and this approach was also very influential among the Flemish nationalists, um, who saw sword dancing as evidence of their ties to um, the German world rather than to the French world, a time when um, French culture dominated Belgium. And one particular um, man called Fistrate also did a lot of work on this. He's published a lot. And um, like Wolfram, um, had a bit of a hiccup after the Second World War, but carried on writing. And um, Wolfram was certainly writing into the 80s. Um, I forget exactly when Fistrate died, but he certainly had a busy publishing career after the war. Um, and we're left with this question of the legacy uh, for, for German sword dancing. As I mentioned, the um, Dietmarscher dance was uh, reconstructed in the 30s. And um, one of the uh, traditional endings for a German sword dance is to raise 
a man, the king, as he's often called, raise him on the swords. And he gives a speech. Well, you can imagine the sort of speeches that were being given out by 1938. Um, and so after the war, there was this need for denazification. And the long-term impact has been a certain shyness about sword dancing in Germany. Um, we don't see much in the way of innovation. Instead, what we see is a looking back to the earlier days of trying to reconstruct the 19th century and before. This is really why I, I've tried to keep what I was doing mainly to up to the end of the 19th century. Um, you can rewrite the King's speech because people still have memories about this stuff. Um, and when you talk to um, sword dancers in Germany or Flanders, you'll find they'll still talk about this menadent idea, um, getting the young men in um, the ceremony, the, very, the importance of uh, the meal uh, at the end of the dancing day, for example, although that's nothing much to do with this either as we'll come to. So it, it, it's very difficult. And you notice that in England, for example, we have a real sense of sword dancing community. Um, we've got things like the Sword Dance Union, um, Dancing England, Rapper Tournament. Um, we've got two publications. We've got The Nut and we've got Rattle Up The Boys. Um, and, you know, sword dancers come together, share ideas, innovate, um, complain about innovation, all that kind of thing. Um, German sword teams do meet. There are sword dancing events, but not, not in the same way. There's not the same um, culture. It's much more seen as your local thing. Military exercise is an interesting one and something you don't read quite so much about. It was undoubtedly there. Um, I've mentioned these Transylvanian Saxons and, um, for example, uh, it was um, the dance of the Skinners or Furriers Guild um, in uh, the city of Hermannstadt. Nowadays, it's the Romanian city of Sibiu. And they provided the infantry um, when it was time for the city to send people off to war. Um, there was another guild, the um, Leathermakers Guild, I think, who um, provided the cavalry. And in the big civic processions, they would have a, a big wooden horse that the uh, apprentices would man and operate. So this was an apprentice's dance uh, for the Skinners and Furriers, and it was seen as keeping them fit and active. So um, they danced with real swords, with sharp swords, and the movements involved things like having a sword swept towards your legs and having to jump over it, and then a sword swept towards your head and having to duck under it, that kind of thing. Very much, um, it, you, you can see the link with uh, military preparedness. Um, Tongeren in Belgium um, had a, a dance for about 600 years, and it came about as the amalgamation of the archers and the crossbowmen's guild into a guild called, called the Mahilin. So they had responsibility for defense of the city. They also had their sword dance, which they brought out on civic occasions. And in 1806, there was a, a French invasion and the guild was disarmed, at which point they stopped their sword dance because they said without the real swords, there was no point in continuing. They didn't just want to carry it on as an activity in itself. It was an emblem of their military prowess. And then we see a picture here of the Schwertanzkampagne Überlingen uh, from the very south of Germany on Lake Constance. And this was originally the Vintners Guild who again um, had military responsibilities and they provided the town guard. And You'll still see this today. They still use swords that were in use 250 years ago. They've got very old swords they use, they're proper swords. Um, and when they go out, they go out in military order. You see them marching down the street. If you look at their faces, they're actually having quite a lot of fun. Um, but um, they came to the sword, one of the Sword Spectacular festivals. I saw them one morning on parade. They'd all got up, they'd all got washed and dressed, and before they went out for their day's programme with the festival, they were taken around the back somewhere, 
And they did a military parade. They were lined up and they got their orders for the day from their commanding officer. And they still see themselves as the town guard. So this military exercise aspect is only a certain number of sword teams, but for those sword teams, it's important. There've been attempts to link sword dancing to other occupations as well. Um, and in particular, we have in the late 50s um, in England, um, Chris Court, Alex Helm and Norman Peacock um, were trying to make links between different dance forms and the economic life of the area from which they arose. So this idea that Cotswold is basically a farm, farm workers dance and that um, Northwest Morris is um, a mill workers dance and that um, sword dancing is associated with mining and metalworking. Um, yeah, it's another trying to think about trying to put things in neat boxes, isn't it? So we've got, you know, certainly there was an association with ironstone mining in Cleveland, uh, with the Sheffield steel industry, with coal. Um, but also then we get to do with fishing, to do with farming. Um, Again, people have taken some specific examples where their theory might apply um, and maybe not paid so much attention to the others. Maybe I'm being unfair to those three in this, but uh, you know, we also then get um, Wolfram mining in Austria, tungsten, um, and coal mining as well in Austria. And, um, Metal working in Habsburg, Poland. So again, there's an element of truth to it, but it doesn't really explain sword dancing. It just explains a subset of sword dancing. This picture I've given um, of this group, the Knappbergschaft Pelfing Bergler, is um, this group, the sword dance is only a small part of what they do. Um, and um, they are from a coal mining community. And of course, that type of work brings people very closely together. It does form a sense of fraternity, if you like, um, the dangers under the ground. So you can see why they would feel very tight. -lit. And we, we, you know, we get this from um, the old Grappa villages um, in uh, the Northeast. Um, it's part of the story. And good old Cecil Sharp. Um, he, he noticed that um, at the time he was looking around, the English sword dance was to be found east of the Pennines. And it therefore followed for him that it was native to the Danelaw, the area, excuse me, <coughs> occupied by the Vikings. And um, yeah, there are other, the famous Scottish occurrences also over in the east, Perth, um, Shetland, of course, up close to Viking country. So this was uh, Sharp's hypothesis. And he set out to prove this by sending out postcards to a whole lot of um, parish vicars, priests. And um, he got you know, various, various reports back. Yes, there used to be uh, sword dancing in my village. I've seen sword dancing that people talk about, whatever. <clears throat> However, he also got postcards back from priests east of the A1 saying, um, yeah, well, I used to be um, just outside Whitehaven in Cumbria, and certainly two of the villages there had sword dance teams. Yeah. And he got one from um, Bolton, from Dean uh, in Bolton. And uh, again, yeah, there used to be a sword dance team there. Now, it's possible that the dance went across with migrating miners at some point. We don't know. Um, but it strikes me, if you only look east of the A1, you're principally going to find stuff east of the A1. And uh, he missed some treats. So if we sort of sum that up, we find we've got occupational uh, groups with their dances, with seamen, fishermen, farmers, miners, that kind of thing. Certainly that, that happened. We've got civic organizations, um, such as trades guilds, by and large, not the merchants, if I can find you an example there, there will be, and sometimes linked to the military responsibilities, not always. Um, 
And then we've got calendar customs, which we're going to be saying a bit more about, um, particularly Shrove Tide um, Carnival, but also Midwinter. And then we've got the private, the personal dances. Um, just, uh, you know, I've got blokes to do my sword dance type of thing. And it, I come back to this question of what were they actually doing? And they, they were all doing different things. It might have looked similar to the outside observer. Do you actually, actually ask the dancers what they were doing? They were doing some very different things. Um, there's a saying, isn't there, that uh, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if one is simply passionate about sword dancing, one will go around looking for evidence of sword dancing wherever one goes. Um, but the significance of what they were doing was very different for them than the significance of what most of us do is for us. Okay, I'm, I apologize here for the really full screen, but this, this is a fascinating one for me. Um, I know it'll be familiar to some of you. Um, 1712, Nicholas Blundell, he was, he was a gentleman from um, Little Crosby between Liverpool and Southport. Um, and he farmed his land. He, he did some of the work himself. He got people to do it. Um, and he had a fairly active social life. It, there's this fantastic um, journal he kept, uh, Nicholas Blundell's Diurnal. Um, and um, it tells you everything about the little things in his life and the big things. One of the big, bigger things for him on, on his uh, farming his lands was the digging of a marl pit. Marl being a type of soil that can be spread to improve the quality of um, agricultural land. But, you know, it's, it's a big job digging the stuff out, carting it away and spreading it all. 3rd of July, 1712, he records, I made a sword dance against my marl pit is flowered. And what's remarkable to me about this is how unremarkable it is. Um, it's no big thing. Um, you're having a celebration of your marl pit. You know, you're going to have a bit of a procession, get the young ladies from the area to do a procession, which he did. Um, you're going to decorate your marl pit with tinsel, which he did. Um, and you're going to put on a sword dance as well. This is the first record of a sword dance um, in England. Um, it eventually made its way to Yorkshire, but that was, you know, they caught up in the end. Um, but uh, and we also know from the Blundell records, there are hints that um, there was sword dancing going on among the Blundells in the 1630s before the Civil War. So here we have the, uh, this completely commonplace idea of making a sword dance. Now, what we know about Blundell was that the family was Catholic. They'd stayed Catholic at the time of the Reformation. And in 1712, um, it wasn't an easy thing to be a Catholic in England. So Blundell spent 10 years, 10 or 11 years of his youth abroad at um, a Jesuit school in St. Omer in the Low Countries. And when a Catholic returned, to England, when Catholic entered England, they had to pay a hundred pounds, which in those days was a great deal of money. Um, so you know, you had to think twice about it. But he'd spent this time over in the Low Countries where sword dancing was very common at that time. I have no evidence that this is where he learned about the sword dancing, but certainly it seems to have been quite familiar to him. So I made a sword dance, 3rd of July, he makes a sort of, what's he mean, I made it? Well, I, I take it from this, he means he wrote it, composed it, because he didn't actually do anything with it until four days later, 7th of July, I began to teach the eight sword dancers their dance, which they are to, the, the flat at the flowering of my mile pit. Um, so we know it's an eight man dance, um, done by agricultural workers, um, and, he composed it on the 3rd, he taught it to them on the 7th, they practiced it again on the 8th in his barn, and on the 9th they performed it, which suggests either they were skilled sword dancers, which I'm not convinced if he only made it on the 3rd, or it's quite a simple sword dance. Um, for the practices, his friend, Dr. Kay, would play, uh, 
he and Dr. Cawood were almost inseparable. Uh, Cawood, I think, lived in Ormskirk. Um, but they, they always visiting each other and going drinking together. For the performance, however, um, we know that the music was performed by Gerald Holsall and Holsall's son. Um, they, this is the only time they crop up in, in the diurnal. But also Richard Tatlock, who's an interesting man in that he played the fiddle and he played the pipes. We're not quite sure what kind of pipes. Um, and he, he crops up once or twice. When Blundell had any sort of um, gathering, social gathering, um, he might invite Tatlock round to play and pay him. Uh, so he wasn't a friend of the family, he was a paid musician. Um, so we know about the use of the fiddle or pipes. Um, we know it was worth bringing a paid musician. Um, and, um, you know, we know something about the dance. Most interestingly, all, um, there were 14 Marlers engaged on the task, and we know the names from the accounts from the payment. We know the names of all 14 Marlers. This is a really good toe hold for someone who wants to go out and start digging through the local records. Um, we don't know which of the eight, which of the 14 were the eight dancers. That's the only thing. So at the end of the marling, once the pit was dug and the, the marl was spread, they had a, another celebration. Tatlock played again. They did the saw dance and Tatlock played again. And then at uh, 12th night, as they went into the next year, um, they held what was known as a merry night. Um, all sorts of entertainment going on, including dancing. They did the sword dance again and Tatlock played again. And then on the seventh, he was paid four shillings for playing at the Merry Night. So we've, we've even got a scale of payment. Um, so we know quite a lot about that. And um, if someone wants to go digging, we can find out about the dancers themselves. I'm sorry, I've not taken any questions so far. Um, I, I will be doing those at the end, if that's okay. So looking again at specific cases, our second case is a, a German one from um, the village of Bilk, which is now a suburb of Dusseldorf. And we know that this was done at Shrove Tide. It was done um, generally on Shrove Tuesday, although they might start a bit earlier as well if they wanted to uh, um, get a bit more in. And we know that all the villages around there used to have sword teams. Um, it was very common. It would be agricultural workers again. And what they would do is they would go out on the road and they would just call at different households. And they would dance generally inside the house in the kitchen. These houses were big because they were both house and barn. Um, and over the kitchen, there'd be a sort of attic where they would hang um, the hands for, you know, aging the season, whatever, and sausages. And this was this is quite a spectacular dance because, um, as I say, it was quite normal for the Germans to form a lock or a rose, as they would call it, and then for somebody to stand on it and make a bit of a speech. But the built dance is a bit different because um, one of the fitter dancers would climb onto or spring, as they would say, spring onto the rose, and then they would go one, two, three, heave, and he'd disappear up into the attic. And the trick was for him to grab a mouthful of um, ham or sausage. And if he managed, he was entitled to sit up there on a beam and eat it, and then jump down onto the swords again. And there are actually records of um, people jumping down and being cut by the swords. They were real swords. The important figure in this was the leader, the four-tensor. And we've got three four-tensor actually named. The dance finished around about 1850 because um, at that point, the church, I think, was a bit concerned about carnival celebrations getting out of hand. And they passed a new rule saying that before Ash Wednesday, there should be a 48-hour period of prayer. And once this was announced, the dancers felt it wouldn't be right to go out and dance during this 40 hour period of prayer. So they just stopped. So again, they obviously put some significant, although this was a, a group of men going out, um, having a bit of a laugh, 
Um, when they dance, um, after they dance, they'd be rewarded with a sausage. And the foo was called the Hanswurst, which is sausage hands. And he carried a long metal spike. And each house they went to, they'd be given their sausage and it would get put on this spike and you'd carry it around. At the end of the day, they'd finish up at the village inn and um, they'd eat the sausages and someone would have given ingredients for brewing beer and they'd drink the beer and eat the sausages. So yeah, it's very much about doing this for reward, the beer and sausage in this case. And quite a lot of the German records are about um, people being rewarded with food, food and drink. If you go back to the Flemish ones, um, some of the earliest records are the town accounts where they pay the dancers in cash or wine. So, you know, they're doing this for reward, but clearly it meant more than that to the built dancers, given that uh, once the church didn't approve, once, once the situation around carnival changed, they simply stopped. They didn't say, well, we can dance some other time. It wasn't just a sword dance in itself. So we know the names of three of the uh, four tensor, and we also know one of the neighboring villages, Hador, um, the last one was a man called Schweder, who died in the winter of 1919 to 1920. So again, for the enthusiastic investigator, we have some names that we can go and investigate. And this brings us on to the third one, which is sort of the way I came into all this, which was Elgin. I looked into this a good, good many years ago. Um, and what we know is that um, on the 7th of January, 1623, James Bonneman, Alexander Petrie, John Petrie, Robert Dunbar, and Archibald Law, these passed in a sword dance in Paul Dunbar's close and in the kirkyard, the churchyard, with masks and visors on their faces. Now, this is from the Kirk Session Minutes, um, the records, and um, they were disguised, they, they were described not as sword dancers, but as guises. Each one was fined 40 shillings, again, quite a lot of money for doing this. Um, and the context of this was that between about 1600 and 1650, the church in Elgin was trying to suppress um, Twelfth Night celebrations. And they had to do it year after year because people would keep going out and doing it. it. Tended to be the young people of the town who went and did it. And it would involve dancing and men and women swapping coats, which was apparently quite risque. And um, this idea of disguise as well. And that, that's, that's what's written down. Probably a bit more went on as well. So in this sense, the sword dance wasn't, it wasn't a sword dancing event. It was a young people having a night out event, at which point somebody said, let's do a sword dance. But we know quite a lot about the dancers themselves. And what we know is really quite striking. So James Bonneman, born in 1600, his father was a Burgess. Now a Burgess was somebody who had the right to engage in trade um, with, with other areas outside the borough. Um, so he was a merchant. Uh, this is really quite unusual among sword dancers. A church elder and a searcher. The, the job of a searcher was to go around and find out who wasn't keeping the Sabbath, who wasn't turning up to church, who was working on Sunday or drinking or whatever. Um, James was married to Janet and they had three children. Um, and in May 1623, he was fined 13 fourpence, one mark, for running profanely up the high street, whatever that involved, plus 20 shillings for missing church one Sunday. That's, you know, again, quite a hefty fine, but he was in the habit of doing this. Um, drinking with others, but also for not paying his fee for the guisings with a sword dance, but also for breaking out of jail. So he, he was a bit of a, a wild lad. In July 1626, he was in trouble for taking part in a blasphemous pledge of friendship at the Market Cross between 3 and 4 a.m. I, I don't know whether that was any more than, you know, you're my mate, I really love you, but, but you know, whatever. 
he shouldn't have been doing it. Um, August 1629, he and Janet, his wife, were summoned for failing to keep the Sabbath again. Um, so a wild young man from a good family. Um, and in 1650, he was made an honorary Burgess, um, just sort of a recognition, an award, for having served the town as a soldier, bearing in mind this was just after the end of the Civil War. So that, that was one of them. John Petrie, um, the second son of James Petrie, or Petrie, merchant Burgess again, so uh, from this merchant class, a bailey, um, which is a type of magistrate and a Kirk elder again. So his father is a very respected man, very respectable man, high status. He was involved in, um, John was involved in some of his father's feuds with other families. Um, these feuds could turn violent. His mother was slanderously accused of witchcraft in 1593 and again in 1613. And then in 1622, she was in trouble along with two Bonniman women. So we see these links between the families of accusing another woman of witchcraft. This is really interesting. You look in this period, this is regarded as one of the really um, strict periods of, of the Scottish church. And there were loads of accusations of witchcraft going around. And from what I've seen, I, I never actually saw anybody punished for witchcraft. What I saw was people punished for making accusations of witchcraft. Um, so you know, it, it was just a way of dirtying someone's reputation. John himself was fined in 1622 for going to a wood at night with other young men and women. Yeah. And by 1651, he was a Burgess and he was a freeman of the town. So a bit of a wild youth, grew up, became a pillar of the community. And his younger brother, Alexander, um, he was also fined for that trip to the wood with the girls. Um, May 1623 fined 40 shillings for uttering presumptuous speeches. Um, don't know any more than that. May 1626, he and two others were fined a mark each for riding the grey mare. I'd love to know what that is. And uh, in 1631, in March of 1631, he became the treasurer of the church. And in October, he became an elder. So suddenly, he's become a respectable man. 1648, he's a vintner. So again, he's um, in the merchant class. 1657, he's a counselor. 1670, a bailey. 1674, he's getting it past it. And he gave up some of the land he'd been renting. Um, oh, and by the way, in 1661, in his wife accused of woman of witchcraft. So again, we see this young man from a good family, bit of a wild youth, settles down, becomes part of the merchant class in the town. Robert Dunbar, son of a Kirk elder. Um, six by 1630, he doesn't seem to have got much into trouble apart from that one event. 1636, an officer of the borough, and he becomes a customs collector, a merchant burgess, a, another vintner. And we see again how intertwined this group of young men, well, this group of men are. 1631, he and some of the Bonnemans were involved in a slander case. 1646, he and Jean Bonneman were ordered to pay a gardener for his services. Um, 1636, his brother Alexander was punished for clinking of basins through the town on Up Halle Eve. Up Halle Eve is 12th night. Um, and the clinking of basins isn't as weird as it sounds. Um, Certainly when I lived in Glasgow, I don't know if it's still the case, um, if you saw a hen party going out during the day, they would all have pots and pans and wooden spoons and they'd just walk along the street bashing them to make a noise. Um, as general high spirits. And then the one exception to this group, in, in a way, was Archibald Law. His farm was father was a former Snowden herald at the court of the Lord Lyon. So this is to do with heraldry, this is to do with um, arms, and with, so titles to land, that kind of thing. And it's, it's a high status job. It's a higher status job, status job than um, being a merchant. 
Uh, and he was a former sheriff clerk of Elgin and Murray, so in the government service. Um, his brother-in-law was a member of the 1615 Parliament. Um, so again, these are people who are familiar with the court in Edinburgh. Um, although in 1605, his brother-in-law had admitted dancing in the Canterbury churchyard at night and marching through the town with a piper, all on the 26th of December. So, youthful high spirits again. And Archibald then disappears, unlike the others, Archibald disappears from the record after this, certainly from the record in Elgin. Um, that given the family circumstance, he could well have ended up going to Edinburgh. My point in emphasizing all this is that I've said it tended to be either um, agricultural workers, miners, maybe artisans, um, skilled workers uh, who belong to the, the trade skills. Um, you very rarely find sword dancing actually performed by people above that social station. We noticed that um, in, in the case of the Lancashire episode, um, you find a, a local gentleman gets his workers to do the sword dance for him. You know. um, among all the other things you, you pay staff to do, I've got staff to do my sword dance. Um, Elgin's really quite different in that these are people of really quite high social status, unusually so when you look across the sword dancing. Um, but as I say, I don't think they saw themselves as sword dancers. The dance was just something that you did um, as part of a broader celebration. The fifth one, uh, the sixth one named is Paul Dunbar, whose land they danced on. And he, he doesn't seem to have been part of this group. Um, he was a gardener, so from a very different social set. He was older than the others. He'd already been in trouble with the, the authorities in 1597. Um, and uh, yeah, all right, he wasn't very well in with the church. He, he had trouble, with, but his problem was that he worked on a Sunday. Um, and then later on, you know, his son obviously didn't take these things very seriously either. So Paul Dunbar doesn't seem to have been part of that set, they just used his land. So we've got dancers who are of high social status, young men who largely grew out of their high spirits of behavior, um, part of a very, again, an informal, very strong social network. And this is the thing we seem to see with, um, with these sword dancers. It's not that they were miners or furriers or agricultural workers. That doesn't seem to be the unifying factor, but these strong social networks seem to be the strong unifying factor between all these different performances. And we see that the dancers, unlike a lot of the ones going on at this time, it was unauthorized, it was spontaneous, and not necessarily the focus of the event. So quite different from the other ones going on in places like Perth and Edinburgh at this time. So here's a question then, who were the dancers? Well, you can't say, um, incredibly varied. Um, they were drawn from a very wide social range, um, if we look uh, more recently at um, some of the Cleveland teams, we see that they are agricultural workers who would go out in the middle of winter when there was nothing much to do on the farms. And they would go and they'd walk around, sleep in barns and collect food, drink and money, and they would uh, drink it, eat it and spend it. Um, so we've got everything from that right up to um, these high civic celebrations. The Perth Glovers famously danced to commemorate the visit of the king to the city on two occasions. Um, so we've got a wide social range. We've got both urban and rural, um, not from the gentry or nobility. That's the only thing we can really say. And Blundell's the interesting one here because um, he's gentry and he sees it as his sword dance, but he doesn't actually get his hands dirty doing it himself, even though he sat up at night making caps for his dancers. There's no record of women doing it before the 20th century. I'm gonna come back to this, uh, but there's no record of women doing it before the 20th century. And still by and large, we only find women doing it in the English speaking world. Um, no doubt you'll be able to find the exceptions to this. Um, but again, looking across, particularly across Belgium and Germany, um, 
sword dancing isn't seen as something for innovation. So essentially, if it's mentioned in the records of 1587, and no women did it in 1587, there's really no reason to think they should start doing it now. Um, so it's really quite a different approach from what we see going on in Britain. Which brings me back to the importance of context and what did people think they were doing? And a lot of these people, I don't think thought of themselves as sword dancers. They thought of themselves as something else of which doing a sword dance was a part, was an aspect. So there's some evidence for almost all the theories. I can't find any evidence for the, for the um, pagan religious one. Um, some of the dances have been since become associated with church events though, um, particularly with Shrovetide and Carnival. Um, so you know, we, we leave that one, but uh, you know, they, there's a certain amount of work. Um, but all of them have got too many exceptions to hold water as a general explanation. So we've got calendar customs and other festivities. And, you know, just breaks from the routine, from the monotony of everyday life. Contemporary records speak, as I've said, of um, rewards with food, drink, cash, applause, prestige. Um, which I think probably people still go out dancing for, don't they? Um, Few of the theorists seem to say much about fun, which is interesting. If you ask people now why people do sword dancing, I'm sure that'd be quite hard their list, but they wouldn't bother doing it. Satisfaction, um, a sense of achievement. Um, and there's also this idea of being part of an in-group, which I suspect for some of these, you know, as I say, a lot of these dances were performed by quite tightly knit groups. And so doing something like a sword dance might come naturally to them. And I just, while I was doing this, I was listening to some music. Um, and uh, in particular, something by a, 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 a Mr. Adam Ant. And his song, Car Trouble, is about young men who've got their first cars and they're polishing them and they're keeping them clean and they're worried about the upholstery and all this kind of thing. And, you know, this obviously is something that brings them together. He recognizes, re recognizes this as a young man's culture. And uh, just almost as a throwaway line, he says, uh, and while this is all going on, while all the mothers and the sisters and the babies sit and rot at home. And, you know, I think um, a part of this is simply what thoughtless young men do. A lot of this is it's just young men going out in the way that young men do and having a good time. This is not to argue that uh, women shouldn't sword dance. It's not to argue that older men shouldn't sword dance. But looking at what went on, that seems to be the, the most common thing. Um, I'm, I would welcome any uh, discussion of this. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the uh, comments now. Um, yeah, Violet Olford tried to link sword dancing with mining in her book. Yeah. Um, well, she wrote, what, 1962 was Violet Olford, wasn't it? I think Court, Court Helm and Peacock were writing in the 50s. But yeah, I, they, they were all, you know, that was a school of thought at that time. I think about 57 they, they published, didn't they? Um, I thought tanning was a trade associated with, so yes, it is. Um, yeah, a rapper does look like uh, a flesh's knife. It's certainly true. Um, so that would make sense. Um, when I asked what, what this sword thing is, you know, half the month swords, are they at all? We call it sword dancing, which brings me back to my hammer and nail point. Um, origins of rapper compared with long sword. Um, well, there are people on here who can say more about that than me, but uh, what I would say, it seems to be an offshoot. Um, unless you believe in theories of convergent evolution, is tempting that uh, you know the same things come up same ideas come up time and time again um but certainly that there, there was sword dancing in the northeast before there was rapper places like hexham uh, recorded having sword dances so it who knows um it could be that rapper is a specialized development it could be that people saw it and thought 
oh, we could use the we could use these things and do a dance with these. Um, yeah, how much it's just someone's seen something once. But a circle dance is, is a really ancient form of dance, um, a very basic form of dance. And the idea then of um, linking yourself in a circle, not just with the hands, um, but with handkerchiefs, for example, or whatever. Um, nobody really knows, do they? Um, what was the prevalent culture? So I just jumped in the area where your sample group of dancers are from, Cavalier or Roundhead? Well, um, the Blundells will definitely have been Cavaliers. Well, they certainly won't have been Roundheads. Um, is sword dance, how much is sword dancing a Catholic thing is a good question. Um, but you know, there, there are associations. Some of the groups, are, particularly in Austria and South Germany, um, associate what they do with going to church and so on. On the other hand, it flourished across the cities of North Germany. Before the Reformation, it sort of started to die out after the, you know, if we take 1600 to the end of the Golden Age, that's really when the Reformation is starting to bite, isn't it? Um, so it's probably more of a Catholic thing than a Protestant thing, but I don't think you can draw any um, firm conclusions about that. Um, sorry, I'm just going to try and scroll up a bit. Um, I'm struck by the tension between getting paid for dancing and getting fined or arrested. This is really true. Um, and if you go back, I say, the earliest records from the end of the 14th century tend to be in town accounts books. And, um, you know, the dancers came and um, we rewarded them with three shillings a head or we rewarded them with uh, eight gallons of wine, whatever it might be. Um, sometimes it seems to have been a regular thing that, you know, it was, they had their group of dancers who came. Sometimes it, was def it definitely wasn't and it was different groups time after time, um, which is it was quite interesting. Um, but there was always this sense of things getting out of hand. In the area near Bilk, as I mentioned, in Western Germany, there was an account from, I think it's the 18th century, where two of the guilds had their own sword dances. And there was one year when there was rivalry between the guilds and they, they started ganging up. So one, one of the sword dance guilds got the lads got together with the lads from another guild against another sword dance guild and the lads from allied guilds. And it was all starting to turn pretty nasty. And in the end, the masters, the grown-ups in effect, said to them, look, just for this year, would you mind not doing the sword dance? And the lads reluctantly agreed. So it could get out of hand. Um, but definitely, um, there was a sense after the Reformation that a lot of the celebrations were too um, worldly, shall we say, um, particularly carnival uh, in, in the Catholic part, places like the Rhineland, where they have uh, carnival on Shrove Tuesday. Um, that's a, a very licentious time, shall we say. And um, the authorities wanted to clamp down. Hence, we see in Bilk this uh, 40 hours of prayer, which is you know, designed to uh, take all the fun out of that run up. Um, and then, you know, the Elgin example, again, um, they're trying, by, by this time in Scotland, they'd done away with Christmas. Um, Christmas didn't become a public holiday in Scotland. I, I think it was about 1970, it was as recently as that. This is why the Scots celebrate Hogmanay, because um, the Kirk didn't believe in the, these big um, materialistic festivals. Um, so yeah, the tension between getting paid for dancing and getting fined or arrested. So there's two, there's the way dancing reflects well on the town. So how Perth paid the Glovers to celebrate the King coming in 1617 and 1633. So it, you know, as a, a re positive reflection on the town, there's things getting a bit out of hand and needing to be calmed down. And then there's finally things being against the spirit of the religious age. Yeah, it's all going on. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about a period of 600, 700 years here. Um, I went to an exhibition of folk art at the Barbican many years ago. My observation was that all folk art is just how people decorate their lives. 
Yes, seems to be a very human trait. Yeah. I think there's some truth. This is what I was saying about um, something to break the monotony. Um, one of the early ones, uh, early 15th century, I think, in Bruges, describes a group of dancers who came there from the village about 10 miles away, which was a fair distance in those days. You know, you're on foot. And they went to Bruges to do sword dancing um, at Carnival. Um, it was worth the effort for them. You know, it was a big thing. So you go there, you dance, you eat and you drink. You really had your day out. So yeah, um, brightening an otherwise dull life, I think is true. Maybe it still is. Um, is there any record of competitions earlier? Um, I've seen nothing about competitions, except, as I say, um, informal competition, trying to put, put, put the other group off. Um, also, writing more complex figures and pride in the dance itself. The Transylvanian Saxon dance I mentioned um, is unusual in that it's so, we have so much detailed notation of it. And we don't really know by and large what they did. What we do know, there are certain figures, they said um, the rose, which we take to be the lock. Um, and the bridge was another figure, um, which was like a tunnel figure really. Um, and those ones crop up time and again, they talk about the rose and the bridge, but no, it doesn't seem to have been about innovation uh, as such. And I say, certainly if you look uh, now, uh, there's definite resistance to innovation. Whether there was that resistance in the past, I don't know. But it was the idea that you had your traditional performance and, you know, we're going to bring out the traditional performance again. You talk to a team like, well, talk to teams like um, Flambra or Papastur, um, and they're not, they're not competing with the neighbours. Um, they're, they're not trying to come up with different dances. They're, they're doing their dance. This is their dance, and they do it. Um, I know there was a, at times there was a certain amount of needle in Sheffield between um, Hansworth and Grenoside, going back a long way, not recently. Um, I suspect that was more about um, who gets to dance at the uh, prize pubs and the most rewarding dance spots. Um, Peter Baring can tell us more about that. Um, is there no uh, competitions yet? Um, so I'm just gonna try to scroll down. Could the friendly pledge be related to trying to form a union? I think that's an idea. I don't know what you mean by trying to form a union, doesn't it? Um, that's an idea from another age. Um, I think um, this was young people going, as I say, I don't know how much more it was than just a drunken, you know, my mate type of thing. Um, yeah. Blasphemous, so by God, I'll always stand by you, that kind of thing. I don't know if there's more to it than that. Um, possibly, I have, but we don't know. Um, your group involving Petri and his friends, the ones getting fined for comedy misdemeanors, were they living in a very Puritan culture? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, if you, um, this is, yeah, um, when are we talking about? 1623, so uh, less than a century after the Reformation. Yeah, um, at this time, the Scottish central government wasn't working very well. And the, the Kirk Session, which was the council of elders who ran the local church, was all powerful in a local community uh, social, over social matters. Um, and they wanted to do away with all what they saw as the abuses of Catholicism, which involved you know, bright clothing, they associated with the abuses of Catholicism, um, worldliness, you know, living for physical pleasure. Um, and being Calvinist, they believed um, that God had already selected who were the winners and losers, and that um, they were a community of the elect, the chosen ones, and it was their job to um, clamp down on sin 
among the rest of the community. Um, we still see this today, don't we? Um, anyone been on Twitter recently? Um, and so, yes, so they're trying to cut down on excessive drinking, um, on dancing, it was particularly um, looked down upon, um, promiscuity, sexual promiscuity, all the things that young people like doing, basically. Um, so, yes, it was a very Puritan culture indeed. Excellent, oh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, and the sword dancing, the form of dancing that women would have been least likely to allow to do. Yeah, I mean, apart from anything else, if we do take it literally, you know, I've asked, you know, can you define a sword to me? I think if you go back into that period, they were dancing with real swords. It's diverged since then. Um, and in those days, women wouldn't have got their hands on swords. But I take you back in all seriousness to the adamant point which is that it tends to be the men who went out and about and the women who are at home with the babies and the children. Um, so they probably had fewer opportunities to get together. They also, they weren't part of these intense social groupings that we see, you know, the fraternities, if you want to call them that, who well, I'm a bit reluctant to, but yeah, that they weren't part of that kind of social arrangement. So on the one hand, they didn't get their hands on the sword. It would have been odd for a woman to have a sword. Um, and the social opportunities weren't quite there in the same way. Um, yeah, associated with war, the youth the dancers might suggest to protest. Yeah, I, I, I do think that um, these young men who in Elgin, who subsequently became pillars of the community, um, it was a kind of protest, you know, we want our fun. And, you know, they were going out at midnight. And doing it. Well, why, why weren't they doing it in the evening when, you know, most people would go and socialise? Well, because they'd have been stopped. So you go out at midnight, you go out at four in the morning, and you do it. it's illicit, it's quite fun, you know, there's that. But yeah, it's, it's a kind of um, protest, I think. Um, traditions. Crucial in Romanian Kalasarsha and football matches get out. Yeah. Yeah. Football matches get out of hand. Um, Jameson says he doesn't have a question for now, but would really like to chat with you about all this. Okay, yeah. Um, his work on literally the agrees about the guilds. Okay, that's nice. We'll do that. Um, also, the way we get hang up, hung up on categorization. Yeah. Um, the worst, worst thing about folklore is folklorists, really. Um, and um, as I say, it's, it's so often people on the outside looking in rather than people on the inside having their own voice about these things. Um, Cratney's stuck under Edith and can't reach the keyboard. There we go. <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. Sorry to you had to give up dancing, Ian. It comes to us all, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I remember Clara well and some, a very happy visit to her one year. Um, yeah. Right, innovation. A couple of times in the 19th century, Erston reported to have introduced new figures at their annual Annick Castle performance. Yeah. I, it's it, it's one of those discussions, isn't it? If you look at the um, records of the sword competitions between the wars, the, the, the rapper competitions between the wars, um, you'll find that things like um, breaking the lock, br breaking the circle to make a lock and display it part of the way through the dance was penalised uh, on some occasions, and um, the somersault was penalised on some occasions um, and it's interesting to see which judges were involved. I mean, they used to get judges in from places like Ephesus again people with no roots in the community but they were because they were university educated they regarded as experts so you've got the outsiders looking in telling telling the locals how their tradition ought to be done um, yeah uh, there were some women from German and Czech groups dancing at later stores but yeah apparently influenced by women's rapid teams yeah um, those sword spectaculars, what do we get? 96, 98, 2000, 
2004 and 2008. Um, so we had those festivals, most of the first one in Scarborough, the last one in York, and the others were all in Whitby. And they were, at that time, they were quite influential. Um, there were people who saw the American rapper dancers come over with you know, some really quite different ways of going about things, and that was quite influential. There was a period when hoisting people up on a sword lock made a difference. Um, there was an obsession with different kinds of sword lock for a time. Um, There's all, all these stones in the water which sent out ripples. I don't know how much of that has had a long-term effect, but yeah, I, I, can, I, I can see how seeing this going on would have made a difference. And I know that, for example, Langawapa from Antwerp have kept their main dance for the men but they now have a women's dance as well. Um, could it be that any record of women or young girls dancing is hidden? Folk not sometimes young girls can dance they 12 or 13 and they no longer take part in public. Um, performance, imitating the sword figures with scarves or the link gown you mentioned. Well, it has to be a possibility, doesn't it? Um, but of course, if they're hidden, we just won't know. Um, certainly when you go out and watch a dance display, not just sword dancing, um, you'll see small children imitating it. Um, and um, I, I know that one of my own sons, for example, um, came home from school one day and said he couldn't understand why no one at school had heard of rapper, because rapper was absolutely everywhere you went. Um, and uh, we've got a family friend who's a um, very young son. He's uh, about three years old. Got um, very frustrated when he wanted to play porridge and they didn't know how to play porridge, um, which, you know, he was imitating his father's Morris dancing. So children do imitate this stuff and it might be that they keep it going. We don't know. All I know is um, I've come across no mention of it whatsoever. Not even women, women being punished for doing it or forbidden to do it. No declarations as to it should be men and not, not women. It just seems to be an assumed that you know, once you start taking up sword, that's men's business. I don't know. Um, what's the significance of a long sword tea? So I've got to scroll down a bit. What's the significance of a long sword team taking a cake sword around them did teams from Germany. Well, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mentioned the um, team from Bilk, whose fool had a, a spike on which he put the sausages they were given. Um, and I think this is probably not, not unusual. Um, certainly the Hanswurst, um, there's a name for the, that's one of the names of the fool, Sausage Hans, um, does seem to, that seems to have been his role, collecting sausages, among other things, I mean, apart from fooling around during the dance. Um, and um, so, yeah, and the natural way to carry it, well, I think carrying a cake on a spike, and any cake I've baked probably wouldn't last very long on a sword. Um, but if you want to carry sausages around, that's probably as good a way as any to do it, isn't it? Um, how often do sword dances come up in court cases? The answer to that is I haven't looked closely enough. I can't, or I looked very closely at the Elden one because the records have all been published and they're all freely available. Um, an interesting byline on that, by the way, is that uh, round about the time of the Elgin sort, when I was looking at the same period of the records, I noticed um, there was a, an account of um, a fight on the road outside Elgin, and a man was struck in the neck with a wrapper and died, and another man was struck in the belly with a wrapper. Uh, it doesn't say whether he died or not. Um, and this is the earliest mention I've come across of a rapper. And it's, it's quite clear that a rapper is just a dialect word for a sword. It's no more or less than that. So all this business of, because they wrapped the handles and got in stuff or whatever it might be, because they wrapped on the pit cage, is, is a load of Hobbes Grant's nonsense. They, they, it's just a word for a sword. Um, how about the nature of the working day, waiting for suitable weather or some other trip? So let's scroll down again. Waiting for suitable weather or some other trade saints days. 
just to give people free time with nothing better to do. Yep, as definitely happened, uh, as I said, um, up in Cleveland when they used to go off for a week or 10 days at a time, just going around the houses and begging in return for doing a sword dance when there was no work to do. Yep, left the women and the babies at home there. Um, nothing like being a small team to drive innovation. Southern Star, a lot of original dancers. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, the three or four dancers. Oh, there we are. So needs must type of thing. Yeah. Um, if you believe that innovation is okay, which the English speaking world seems to think yes, and the non English speaking world seems to have more reservations about that. The involvement of Molly's or Bessie's in sword dancing plays, just that women were barred from dancing. Um, that's a very good point. Yeah, it, it was the men's thing. Although, <clears throat> as I say, um, yeah, it might be. Women didn't take place in, didn't take, take part in drama either, did they, in the past? Hence all the um, women's parts in Shakespeare being played by boys in the past. So, uh, yeah. Um, have I got any more? No, I think that's, that's all of them. How are we doing for time? Oh, blimey. How's that? Spot on. Um, um, yeah, well, I just want to say that uh, I aspire to have staff to do my sword dancing. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime, I am prepared to dance for beer and sausages. Um, so <laughs> uh, can we all just unmute ourselves and give Andrew a massive round of applause, please? Thank you very much. And thank you for the at the end. That, 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 that was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> at the end, yeah. Well done.